So, uh, welcome to this month's Austin PHP, and we're going to talk about a framework or micro framework, the version of which is not quite out yet, but they released a beta last week. So, and I've been using it for one microservice for a little while, and um, another kind of folder stack website since earlier today. So, can talk about Slim 3, the micro framework. Um, there's a link to slides right here. You can go ahead and follow along with me if you'd like um, and find out what I'm going to say before I say it. Uh, alternately, you can look at the slides afterwards if you'd like. So, with that, let's jump right in. Actually, first, a little bit about me. Um, so, I do web development, I prefer APIs. Sometimes I do UI stuff, it looks okay, okay, not, not really okay, it looks like a Twitter bootstrap. But that said, um, I primarily API dev, mostly PHP, and um, I like playing with new stuff. In this case, it's Slim 3, in other cases, it might be Falcon <coughs> or Aura or one of a number of other things. I freelance uh, currently and am quite busy with a few different projects, uh, either building code, making code run better, fixing problems, adding features, uh, a lot of it. And as mentioned here, um, if you are in Northwest Austin and you are free at lunch on the second or fourth Thursday of each month, uh, so that would also be today, I spend five minutes on Monday posting an event on Meetup and an hour or two on the Thursday actually facilitating the Austin Web Developer Lunch Meetup. So you should come and join and um, talk shop if you like. So what exactly are we going to talk about? I'm not going to go through every single line of code in Slim 3 and say, and this is what this thing does, and this was, is what this thing does. Number one, I didn't write the framework, and number two, you can do that on your own time. What I will do is introduce a few of the new concepts in Slim 3, as opposed to older versions of the micro framework or just PHP in general, and, um, and go through how the pieces fit together, as well as go through a few real world applications that uh, I've worked on either from the ground up in Slim 3 or as an upgrade from Slim 2 to Slim 3, one of which we'll probably be using after this presentation completes to raffle off some prizes. Um, so if it doesn't work, uh, you can either blame me or the creators of Slim for doing uh, amazing things. Um, so that. Why would you use Slim rather than this uh, new hotness by the name of Lumen, the uh, Laravel micro framework? Or why would you use it rather than Silex, the uh, progeny of the illustrious Fabio Potencier and the Symphony Project? Well, the thing with Slim is it's decoupled, it's small, it's fast, and it's not actually that opinionated. As a result, um, you end up with something that uh, if you have an idea of what you want your application to look like, then Slim isn't going to get in your way. All it is, is a dispatching layer using middleware, a concept that I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, that maps URLs in HTTP requests and responses to actions. Uh, it also includes a dependency injection layer so that uh, you're not uh, throwing around globals in order to connect to a database or do other very useful things that don't involve directly modifying a request or a response. So the other thing with Slim is you aren't tied particularly to a particular framework's way of doing things. In Silex's case, it's a uh, nice pretty API around Symphony stuff. In Lumen's case, it's a nice, pretty API around the subset of what Laravel can do. Slim takes P 
PSR 7, the newly released HTTP message standard, and uh, actually implements it in a way that uh, is not terribly opinionated. That may be an asset or liability depending on how much effort you want to put into thinking about architecture of your application first rather than letting somebody else decide it for you. Um, so take that caveat as you will. But it also allows you to only pick the pieces that you need. Notice the very small list of dependencies in here. If you uh, install it by, by a composer, then you will see those very few dependencies fly down your internet connection very quickly. Uh, that's all you need as a starting point to build your Slim app. And then you can expand on from there. So, with all of that said, Slim is particularly good for getting something out the door rather quickly. Not super ridiculously quickly because it doesn't have CRUD generation. It's, it's not Rails. You can't go from zero to application in, um, okay, well, you have to set up uh, Fusion Passenger and a few other things. So it's, let's call it 30 minutes. But um, for a quick proof of concept or a full-on API where you really want uh, just something to say, I want this HTTP route to map to this given action. Um, Slim lets you do that very quickly, very easily, and in a way that uh, you don't end up with a whole lot of um, magic going on behind the scenes. It, it's, you can follow what you're doing pretty easily. So, this is a very basic, does almost nothing Slim application. Assuming that you've already um, pulled down Slim, which I have commands for on the next slide, then you require it um, by a composer or uh, via some other auto-loading mechanism, but composer is preferred. Then you instantiate it. You set up a few routes, and then you run the thing. So in this case, this application, if I uh, fired it up and went to slash, then it would give me a nice hello world. And if I went to slash Logan, then it would be saying hello Logan. Now, if you are somewhat familiar with the PSR 7 standard, you'll notice that this response write thing, that write is not actually part of the PSR7 interface. However, um, the nice thing about the slim implementations of the request and response um, are that it has a few convenience methods on there so that you're not writing a whole bunch of chain method calls to get where you want to go. But you may be wondering, okay, these are callbacks, it's got this request and response here, what, what exactly is going on? This doesn't look like a micro framework that I've used before. So, we'll actually get to that. That's the point of a middleware system. But first, let's take a quick look at what we need uh, to actually get this thing started on your bare metal system that already has PHP installed. Blinking and missing. So, Composer requires Slim. And uh, make sure that you are on the dev minimum stability because right now Slim 3 is not actually out. And from there, um, your PHP as of 5.4 has a built-in web server, so you can just point that at uh, index.php or whatever you decide to call uh, your front controller and run from there. So, there are a few core concepts in Slim. One of them is uh, routing, one of them is dependency injection, and the one we're going to talk about first, however, is middleware. This is why you have your request and response as parameters for those closures that I showed you earlier. Uh, when you're dispatching a route, 
you say, all right, I take this route, I have this function, this callable, which can be one of a number of things. It will always take a request, a response, and uh, if you have route parameters, it will take an array of arguments that the router will pull out of your route. Uh, for example, if we go back to this slide, the args here, maps in this case would be name, and then we use it here. Um, now, one important thing to note is <coughs> the request and response, the reason that they are passed in uh, for each of these closures is that response is immutable. The response, anytime you make a change to it, it will return a new instance of that object. Therefore, you kind of have to pass it around uh, rather than referring to a given static instance of the response that's global to the application. That's a big change from Slim 2, and that was a very much thought over excuse me, point in the PSR7 standard. But we are, um, we are now in the land of immutable value objects for both your request and response, and as a result, uh, you can chain method calls to your heart's content to change a request or response over time. For example, adding a line to the body, setting a header, uh, or one of a number of other things. If we jump back up to the beginning of this slide, though, um, you'll see that this uh, middleware system is not without precedent. Other languages, other frameworks have done it before we have. But PHP has never been known to not steal a good idea, or a bad idea for that matter, but we'll uh, get to that post-presentation. Um, the way a middleware system works is you have an HTTP request coming in. That request is then acted upon by a number of various layers, each layer uh, being inside uh, the one prior to it. Eventually, you get to the core of your application. The application uh, does some more stuff uh, with that request, uh, maybe modifies the response a little bit more, spits the response back out, and you go back the outside the layers of the onion until you get back out to the last layer of the middleware, that returns your response, and then it gets handed out to the web server and over to your browser. Um, the nice thing about the way middleware works is, particularly with immutable value objects, you can, um, you can take a request or response, tweak it just ever so slightly, or break the chain and immediately return a response if, for example, somebody uh, exceeded a rate limit, or if they uh, failed authentication, or if a page that you would have normally rendered was already cached in the system somewhere else. You can short circuit the evaluation of uh, a given route at the middleware level. Alternately, you can let the middleware pass things through, and that's uh, what this dollar next thing is that I will show you shortly. So, let's actually look at some code. These are a couple of middlewares, and you'll notice that the last one that I uh, talk about is actually executed first once the request comes in, because each middleware that you add is like layers of an onion. You peel the first one, you, you add them in order of from the core outward, and then you execute them in the order of outward in. In this case, we're taking an authentication uh, service that I've declared somewhere and said, does this user, based on this web request, authenticate? If not, immediately return a response rendered by some other service of, you can't go here. Alternately, if they do authenticate, then go ahead and pass the request on to the next callback, which is further inside the middleware, 
stack, or alternately, your core application itself. And at any point in this, this request and response, you can pass that next layer, whatever you feel like. Uh, it could be the original request and response. It could be something completely different. The system doesn't care. For this second middleware, we're actually changing both the request and the response uh, in the middleware. In this case, we're always passing it through. First, we set the header. And then we say, all right, let's, let's go ahead and call the next middleware. We get that back as a response because the middleware or an application will always return a response. And then finally, we say, all right, we've got the response, but I want to add a little comment at the bottom of the page saying it took this long to render. So I can do that right here. And that going in and then coming back out, a uh, way of uh, interacting with a web request, ends up being very powerful for writing quick, easy middlewares uh, to do whatever you decide to do. So, the second big concept of Slim 3 is a revised routing layer. You might say, okay, well, routing is routing, it's no big deal. Well, they actually took routing out of Slim, out of the Slim core, and uh, decided to use a much faster uh, implementation, uh, Nikita Popov's fast route. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Nikita, he is one of the reasons why PHP 7 is so darn fast. Uh, Fastroot is no exception to the, uh, his practice of building blazingly fast code. So it's a, a regular expression based router uh, that's highly optimized. And uh, if you are just developing on Slim, that's one less thing that you have to worry about. Uh, you can either have placeholders without any constraints like the name uh, that I showed earlier, or you can specify reg regular expression constraints to say, I only want this route to match if it's a word character, or if it's a digit, or if it's a hexadecimal character. Um, Additionally, the router can dispatch not only to a closure like we have seen so far, but also to a, um, a method in a class that is thrown into your dependency injection container. Um, so you don't have to have a single one file to rule them all uh, system for executing your Slim app if you don't want to. Uh, you can divide things up into uh, either uh, controllers and actions within those or action classes that implement double underscore invoke uh, to, um, to call what's inside them. Uh, and this is here just so I didn't forget. If you want to prefix, for example, slash um, insert role here, slash user, slash uh, a big old group of routes, instead of typing slash user, slash every time on every route declaration, you can wrap that in a route group and then go from there. So I keep talking about this dependency injection container. Actually, the concept is pretty simple. Um, there is, I believe it's, on the order of 100 lines of code, dependency injection container by the maker of Symphony called Pimple. Uh, and what that does, if you're not familiar with uh, dependency injection containers, is it provides a single place for you to uh, put uh, services or pieces of your application so that they can be uh, referred to in a modular way uh, throughout the application. In the case of Slim, the default implementation is, all right, we throw a request, response, and a double handful of other services into this uh, superset of a pimple container, and then load that into the application. 
If you want, however, you can, for example, add a database or uh, some API client instantiated or one of a number of other services into that dependency injection container prior to instantiating your app. In this example, I'm adding my uh, awesome my service here, uh, instantiating the container before I even start building my uh, application instance. Then, once the container is fully formed, I can go ahead and say, all right, I want a Slim app. I want that app to use this particular dependency injection container, and now I have all those services available, and I can even test that container outside the context of the Slim application if I want to. Now, one of the things I said earlier is Slim is flexible. You can mix and match components as you want and build something that is uh, tailored to your own whatever you do. The dependency injection container is a key part of this. So if you decide that, for example, you don't want to use uh, a pimple as your dependency injection, injection container, you can actually, as long as you specify the stuff that Slim is looking for, have an entirely different dependency injection container, for example, or a DI, or I believe uh, the League of Extraordinary PHP Packages uh, container also uh, adheres to this interface. But any container that uh, conforms to the container interop um, interface can be used in Slim. In the container interop interface, I believe all it does is says uh, this has to implement the method get. Um, at any rate, you can either swap out the dependency injection container entirely, or you can override specific services within it. Uh, for example, overriding the error handler service in Slim, so that instead of either white screening or spitting out some pretty printed HTML error, it instead logs to your service of choice and spits out a uh, JSON how uh, VD error. Um, body that says here's your log reference and now we can actually figure out why this thing white screen even if somebody is on the other end of connection and all they can say is well I have this uh, number here does that mean anything to you? So again you, you have a whole lot of flexibility in building your application based on the dependency injection container but with intelligent enough defaults that you can still build an entire app in less than 100 lines of code if it's a uh, trivial one. So there are a few things that Slim 3 no longer has that Slim 2 did. It's focusing more on uh, maybe APIs or just doing one thing well. Um, for example, the view module that is uh, that takes a template and then renders variables into it, that's gone. Uh, if you want to use Twig or if you want to use Aura View or one of a number of other uh, template engines like Blade, you can do that. But Slim does not have a uh, default implementation, although it does have, for example, a bridge to Twig that you can include by a composer. It also does not have any uh, cryptography modules anymore. Um, generally speaking, building crypto on your own is not a particularly amazing idea in the first place, and uh, Josh Lockhart, the creator of Slim, and primary contributor, um, said, yeah, I, I made that mistake, let's roll that back. So if you want to use uh, cryptography really good stuff other than, say, built-in PHP password hash, then you're going to want to pull in something like send crypt. Uh, additionally, uh, your uh, request and response objects um, in addition to being uh, used in the context of a closure being executed or a function or a method being executed, there also are a few convenience methods like uh, the gotcha that I spent probably a half hour, 45 minutes on today. You can't actually, uh, you don't have a convenience method for setting cookies. So you have to uh, roll that on your own right now. There, it looks like they'll probably add that back. Um, but 
that was something as a result of the PSR uh, 7 standard that they decided that the interface was not going to include anything about cookies in there. Um, and Session and Flash support as well. Uh, those are now available via third-party add-ons. Well, actually first-party add-ons, they're just in a different repo, in a different composer package. And, well, they were going to take out the ability to echo from these uh, rub dispatch closures, but there was enough of a, back, of a backlash from uh, people who were using the application, uh, who were using the framework, that uh, they ended up keeping that in. So, on to the um, pieces of information that you probably can't find in several different blog posts on the internet. How does this thing work in real life? Well, case number one, uh, we needed a microservice uh, at one of the companies that I work with in order to render some PDFs and we couldn't just throw the PDF renderer on uh, every single machine because it's uh, licensed per machine. Um, so I said, okay, let's Let's actually do this right now that we're actually having a few different customers of this uh, of this library and pull it into a microservice. Um, several hours and 300 lines of code or so later, 200 lines, um, 200, uh, <laughs> you have a slim application that uh, yes, I'm doing uh, a require to pull in my routes, I'm uh, auto-loading some pieces, but uh, it was a relatively quick uh, time to getting things working, and it included a fair number of uh, interesting features like uh, being able to uh, trick the Amazon Elastic Load Balancer into only having uh, one of these servers uh, up at a time, so we weren't violating the license of the library. Um, and that was all in very little code, it's so very quick, very configurable, and um, I wasn't pulling in thousands of lines of code that I didn't need. So that was the good part. The bad part is that I had to go in and create a couple of services that proxy to um, underscore post and underscore file super globals because at the time, um, I believe this is still somewhat the case as shown here, Slim did not have a good way of turning a uh, multi-part form data uh, request into the uh, PSR7 request object. They're still working on that. I'm sure it will be complete prior to release, but if you're dealing with a mix of uh, files and strings uh, that comprise that request, uh, that's one thing to watch out for. It's, it's a really easy workaround, only takes a few lines of code, but it is not supported currently natively in, in the um, request and response. Um, and aside from that, things just worked. Oh, and uh, documentation, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot out there for uh, Slim 3, and there particularly wasn't uh, when I was building this. So it was a mixture of uh, looking at what documentation was there and um, finding the implementation of uh, the functions that I was calling and, and seeing what those did. But with those caveats, there were fun things like overriding the error handler, as I mentioned earlier, to spit out a, um, an error message in uh, a format that wasn't sending HTML over to my API client and was expecting JSON. And also sending details on that error to um, a login service of some sort. So the second uh, piece of these uh, use cases that I promised in the description of this meetup 
is Rafa. Um, I decided that, okay, let's, let's see what happens if I try to convert a Slim 2 application into Slim 3. And um, granted, it's a small application, not too many lines of code. And the number of lines of code ballooned a little bit after I made the conversion. But in exchange for a little bit more code, um, I was able to take a couple of extracts out of my templates and the resulting code, uh, if I ever wanted to write tests for it, is a lot more testable now because I'm not in my index.php doing a use dollar app or use dollar uh, raffle service halfway down my code, at which point there's no way other than uh, splitting out the files and re-architecting the app that I could um, pull some of those routes out and test them. Uh, the dependency injection container uh, and the way that works with Slim 3 uh, made it really straightforward as to what I needed to do to, um, to pull those services in to the uh, application and then read them back out. Um, as I was executing those routes. So it actually resulted in giving me a uh, more correct application, if you will. So those were the good things. Um, bad things is you, as I mentioned earlier, don't have the ability to say response with cookie, key, value, HTTP only, secure, expiration, etc. Uh, that just flat out isn't in the response campaign on Slim. Uh, I was on Slim IRC on Freenode um, and was going back and forth with uh, some of the devs on Slim there and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of resolution around it but um, part of the reason that that had actually gotten stripped out was that if you're using this on an API, you really shouldn't be using cookies anyway, so it's super, superfluous behavior. But if you're rendering a single bit of HTML and you're doing that to the uh, browser, then you probably want cookies. So this omission is just something that you have to watch out for. And as mentioned here and before, the docs still need some work. I'll probably be pull requesting some of the stuff that I found out about uh, cookies uh, after double checking to make sure that uh, that information is accurate um, into the docs. Also, because this was a pretty small application and because uh, the middleware request response uh, arguments way of doing things is quite different from the, uh, the old Slim 2 way of Oh, if you're passing in, what you'd be passing in, in the, on the Slim 2 side would just be a, um, the values for each of the name parameters of the route. Uh, there's a whole lot of code churn uh, required to get this up to where it is now. The flip side of that is some of that code churn was because I was cleaning up the application as I went. Um, it was, I think, 100, like 100. 40 or 150 lines added and um, about 70 lines removed uh, or 60 lines removed uh, on the commit uh, to move this up. And you can check that on GitHub and see exactly what I did. So back to the resounding question of I'm building a new application, should I use Slim for that? And right now, maybe uh, if you are willing to work around uh, or don't have the issue of, of uh, cookies or if you don't have the issue of having to um, deal with multi-part form data. Uh, there are easy workarounds, so you can either do them if you need to or you may not even uh, need to work with that sort of thing. Um, some of those issues should be resolved, in fact, Probably both of those issues will be resolved 
when Slim 3 actually comes out right now, it's at beta 1. Uh, but that's, that's my guess with reservations. Also, Slim 3 may not be the, um, the perfect thing for your next new generation uh, CMS that you would have built on a full stack framework, uh, such as Laravel or Symfony or uh, ZF or, or what have you. Uh, it might be, but if you would rather uh, follow someone else's opinions uh, on application architecture uh, than create your own, uh, then Slim isn't for you. It, it's quite unopinionated other than the uh, middleware request response uh, function signature uh, side of things. And with that, um, here are a bunch of resources that I drew a lot of the uh, information in this presentation from. And if you, if you want to find out more information about SLIM, uh, you can just go here and, as noted, both the documentation and the uh, brochure or website for SLIM, which is actually a Jekyll site because it's a GitHub IO, um, are available on GitHub and you can fork and PR and fix things. With that, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, one thing before uh, I actually do that is, uh, back on the dependency injection slide, you may have uh, wondered what the, what this um, my service bit does. Um, and as mentioned in the comments, um, the app proxies the container and uh, the app's magic methods, uh, double underscore get in this case, uh, proxy uh, pulling stuff out of the container. So you can say, and the app itself is bound to these route uh, callable closures. So you can actually say this insert random service name here rather than saying app get container get this other service and then start doing uh, useful things with it a few function calls down the road. Uh, with that clarification, um, I guess Logan will um, put a new reel of film in his uh, camcorder or something and then we'll go for questions. Thanks Ian.